a bill written in secret by Senator McCain and Senator Carl Levin that would give the U.S. military and not civilian law enforcement agencies the ability to arrest anyone and hold that person indefinitely, even if that person is an American rested, arrested on American soil. They affirm in statute for the first time a power that the president has merely claimed, and that's the power to detain indefinitely American citizens without charge or trial. That should be of grave concern to all Americans who care about our constitutional rights to a fair hearing. Basically, to take them out of the criminal justice system and remove from them the protections that are, quote, guaranteed, close quote, by the Constitution. You oppose this? You drew the ire of John McCain and Carl Levin, senators who drafted this amendment to an appropriations bill in secret. Why are they mad at you? What's your argument? Well, they're mad at me because I'm defending the Constitution. I'm defending liberty. This country was built upon the idea of liberty. And if we are uh, fighting terrorism and destroying liberty in the process, then we're not really accomplishing the goal of defending this country. Uh, so I think we need to go back to the Constitution. American citizens should never be detained, uh, certainly indefinitely, without charge or trial at the discretion of the president. That is completely outrageous, and my, my constituents agree with me. Without any of these rights, that person can now be locked away forever under this law. No right to appeal, no right to contest, and therefore this completely works against the principles we hold dear because those principles were set up the fifth amendment and sixth amendment were set up to defend us against the overreach of an executive branch and yet we have stripped away tonight those protections there is one thing and one thing only that is protecting american citizens and that's our constitution the checks we put on government power. Should we err today and remove some of the most important checks on state power in the name of fighting terrorism, well then the terrorists have won. What's going on here? I mean, everybody in the Senate took an oath to uphold the Constitution, which says no person, doesn't even say no American, it says no person shall be denied life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And here they go ahead and vote for legislation that denies it. Well, you know, we had a discussion about this among some Republicans at lunch, and one other Republican senator read from the Constitution and pointed out all the places where you are guaranteed a trial by a jury, while you're guaranteed a speedy trial, while you're guaranteed habeas corpus, you're guaranteed all these rights, and it does strike me as perplexing that anyone could vote to send an American citizen who's been accused of a crime to a detention center in a foreign land without due process really is beyond me. What justification did these people give for this? Most of them argue that Hamdi and Quirin, two Supreme Court cases, have justified holding U.S. citizens as enemy combatants. Uh, they also argue that the Padilla case did, but that wasn't a Supreme Court case. I guess my point is, is that I agreed with Scalia, who is the dissent in the Hamdi case, and who said that really high treason has been tried in our courts usually, and it is the exception to ever give up our rights. It's happened during war, but my point about this is this is a war without end. I'm afraid of giving up the right to trial by jury and hoping that someday they will declare an end to this war and they'll give back the right to trial by jury. It really concerns me. It's very interesting how people can twist and torture language. Hamdi was a case lost by the Bush administration in which Justice O'Connor said everybody's entitled to a trial. And Quirin was a case lost by the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration which said even a German saboteur was born in the United States of America was captured trying to blow up munitions plants during World War II was entitled to uh, a trial. But here you have uh, colleagues of yours who can read the Constitution as you do, basically throwing up their arms and saying, well, since pre presidents before Obama have gotten away with this, we might as well write it into the law and let him and successors do so lawfully what the other presidents took a chance on doing? Well, their other argument is that there will be one procedural hurdle, and the procedural hurdle is that there will be a habeas, or you have to present the body, the judge has to rule on whether or not the person can be held. But my argument to them was that to me is the beginning of due process, that's not the end of due process. To have a habeas hearing before a judge to see if you can hold a prisoner 
is the beginning of due process, but that's not all of due process. Due process involves a jury trial, a judge, uh, legal help on both sides of the equation and a conclusion. So there's much more than just a habeas hearing. Right. But they claim that having a habeas hearing is enough. But the problem is, is then you hold somebody after one hearing, you can hold them indefinitely. Their argument also is they say, well, 27% of the prisoners we've released from Guantanamo went back into combat. But my response to them was, those 27% that were released weren't released because of due process. They were released because some generals in the administration decided to let them go. It had nothing to do with due process Got letting it. them go. Got in it. fact, due process, we've convicted several people in the United States through due process. Why would Republicans, the Republicans who voted for this, want to give this power to a president who is the most polarizing in modern times and with whom they disagree on so much right to his core values. Why give this power to him? They didn't give it to George Bush, they didn't give it to Bill Clinton. Why are they giving it to Barack Obama? Well, I'm going to agree a little bit with my uh, friend David Schweikert that uh, a lot of the members who voted on this were uh, unclear about the language. The language is written to be intentionally misleading, in my opinion. I think it's, it's intentionally unclear so that the people who do want to give this power to uh, the executive branch can get away with it without uh, scaring off enough of the members where, it's, where it doesn't pass. Why those members want to give the uh, government that power? I think it's because they trust the government. They believe that the government doesn't make mistakes. They believe that the government doesn't abuse its power. And that's, that's frightening. I wonder what planet they're living on if they trust the government and they believe it doesn't make any mistakes. All you have to do is read the Constitution. The people who wrote the Constitution uh, didn't trust the government. Is this the end of it? Have we lost this battle? Or is there another vote to come? Is there a chance something will happen in the Senate? Is the president going to sign this? Am I going to wake up on Christmas morning and wonder who's in my backyard? I think, unfortunately, the president is going to sign it. And I'm not sure that there's much we can do about it right now. Uh, we still have to raise public awareness about what the bill does. And we have to remind our members of Congress uh, that this was a 2,000-page bill. And the, the kind of effort put on members, the kind of pressure was, we have to pass this bill now so we can find out what's in it. For those who were concerned about the provisions, that's essentially what they were told. We have to remind members of Congress that that's not justified, that that's not acceptable. What we're talking about is an amendment to the Defense Authorization Bill, which permits the United States government to use the military in violation of the Posse Comitatus Act, which has been in place since 1876, and to use the military to arrest American citizens and hold them in indefinite detention with no recourse to courts of law. Now, this constitutes the repeal of the United States Constitution. You're letting them circumvent the Constitution after 200 years here. will be the first generations, we argued, that abandon, truly abandon, this, 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 this most important aspect of a free society. All that we hold dear as Americans in this Constitution about our fair rights as citizens has been trampled on tonight. Whenever you suspend due process, which in effect suspends the rule of law, you walk down a very dangerous path and you give authority to your government that it can then wield essentially without restraint. This is the essence of dictatorship. And, and we, we look at Nazi Germany and we say, yes, that's the essence of dictatorship when the Gestapo can just go barge into a person's home at night and cart him away to a concentration camp. That's the system we now live under that's being called freedom. This Lindsey Graham or Graham Lindsay, the cracker from South Carolina, he said the United States is a battle zone. Could you imagine that? So that's what's happened. Senator Lindsey Graham, who supports this bill, says, quote, the homeland is part of the battlefield, and people can be held without trial, whether an American citizen or not. I guess he hasn't read the Constitution recently. Under the provisions, would it be possible that an American citizen then could be declared an enemy combatant and sent to Guantanamo Bay and detained indefinitely? Uh, no matter who they are, no matter who they are, if they pose a threat. They all voted 
to give this power to the military despite the fact that the Pentagon, the FBI, the CIA, the Director of National Intelligence, and the head of the Justice Department's National Security Division all told the Senate, don't vote for this. It's a very bad idea. And yet they did. What is the most gigantic power that any, any totalitarian dictatorship can have in its possession? I mean, it, it's not just the power to, to you know, tax people or control their economic activity, uh, confiscate their guns. It's the most direct power is the power to just go out and send your military forces, your intelligence forces, and start rounding people up and using force to do it. You know, you get a company of, of, of uh, infantry money, and you go in around, surround somebody's house, you barge down the door, and everybody's got his guns pulled. They're all SWAT team deals, and you, you go in there, and you seize that person, and you cart him away to a concentration camp or to a, a detention facility. You don't give him a trial. He's an enemy combatant. This is war, you know. I mean, that's the most direct power. Oh, and guess what? <laughs> That power goes back centuries into British history, into, into British tyranny. I mean, th this was the most tyrannical power that the British people were so concerned with throughout all the centuries. In fact, the, 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 that's what Magna Carta was all about. You know, when, 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 when the barons of England held their own king, King John, at the point of a sword, I mean, they were rebelling against their king because their king had been going out just grabbing people, or through his, his military, grabbing people, carting them away to the Tower of London or some dungeon, putting them on the rack, torturing them, executing them, for criticizing the government, for questioning the regime. And so, uh, you know, along comes uh, the, this rebellion at Runnymede, and they, they, they extract from the, the king. They win. They beat the king. They beat their own king. And they, and they extract from him an admission that never again will he go and grab a person in violation of what Magna, called, Magna Carta called the law of the land. And, and that phrase, law of the land, gradually through the centuries of more and more resistance to, to the tyranny of their own government, the British government, that phrase came to be known as due process of law. So the idea was that, hey, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, King, or hey, Mr. President, or whatever, uh, you're not going to be able to seize anybody and punish them for, for some criminal offense or alleged criminal offense unless you go through these procedures, due process of law, trial by jury, right to counsel, right to confront witnesses. I mean, these are the constitutional guarantees in the 4th, 5th, 6th, and 8th Amendments. And the reason they were there, remember the reason why the Bill of Rights was enacted in the first place, was because the American people weren't enthusiastic about the idea of a federal government. You know, when it was proposed in, after the Constitutional Conventions, Americans were leery. They, they suspected that this new federal government would end up attracting uh, totalitarian-like people, people that would do the same thing that the British king had been doing. And that's what they were concerned with. And, of course, there were those that said, oh, no, not in America. We don't have those kind of people in America. But the American people said, oh, bull, those people exist everywhere. It's like in their DNA, and they're going to be coming after us, and they're going to be born and all this. And it doesn't matter how you bring them up or whatever. It's in their DNA to try to do these kind of things. And uh, so they, how did they protect the, uh, us or them? You know, they said, well, you know, we're going to demand this Bill of Rights, which was really a Bill of Prohibitions. And it didn't, even, it didn't just guarantee freedom of speech and freedom of the press and uh, gun rights and so forth. The Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Eighth Amendments, four amendments dealing with the power of the government to go out and seize somebody and, and just cart them away. Uh, so those, those are the protections. It says, no, before you do that, you have to go through these obstacles. They're, they're sort of like barbed wire entanglements that the government's required to go through. Well, that's the system we lived in, uh, you know, for more than 200 years. I mean, it, it was really, I mean, there's a lot of problems with the criminal justice system and, and the federal system. But really, when you compare it to all the others around the world and all the others in history, I mean, we had the greatest, you know, constitutional legal system that one can never imagine. 
I mean, these obstacles, these, these barbed wire entanglements were something that we were proud of. That, hey, if a foreigner came in, he would be treated just like an American. You know, he'd be, have to be indicted in a federal court. They'd have to prosecute him. He's entitled to presumption of innocence. If he couldn't afford a lawyer, a lawyer would be appointed for him. He, his justice in that system would be just like that of the American people. I mean, it was a remarkable system. Imagine you're an American arrested by the United States military, not by civilian law enforcement, on U.S. soil. And imagine the military had the right to hold you forever. It is not what a free society is all about. It is antithetical to the principles of a free society. You cannot be free. Ask any Egyptian. You cannot be free as long as the government wields this kind of dictatorial power. The president can arrest whoever he wants anywhere in the United States of America and keep them without charging them with a crime, without letting them see a lawyer, without bringing them to a judge for as long as he wants. That gives the military the right now to, you know, arrest anybody, a person like me, that really doesn't dig what's going on in a lot of places, and call me a terrorist. I have no lawyer, no rights, I'm gone. Woof, they ship me overseas. You know, anything. Give the president the power to be judge, jury, and executioner. That's the law now that, that entitles them to round up people, uh, send them into military dungeons, send them into concentration camps, simply on the basis of a label put on them by the military, the CIA, the president, that they're a terrorist. Okay? No court trial, no jury trial, no nothing. We're talking about the repeal of the United States Constitution. And what we see from the vote against the amendment by uh, Rand Paul, the Republican senator from Kentucky, to exempt American citizens from this amendment to the defense authorization bill that will allow the military to simply pick up any American citizen anywhere on earth and hold them indefinitely without charges. What we see is that Rand Paul's amendment got voted down by the U.S. Senate. The power is now possessed by the government. It's now in its tool chest. Major crisis hits. They start rounding up people. How alien would that be to see troops with rifles and helmets marching in our streets, Congressman Amash? Something we haven't well, seen in America since Reconstruction. Again, it would be a travesty. It's what our founders fought against. It's why we became an independent nation. It's why we fought to put the Constitution in place and uh, create a system where liberty would be defended. And if we go back to the, the old way, then uh, it's the same as though we were under British rule. The government is using fear to scare us into justifying its actions. And those of you that are familiar with Robert Higgs's book, Crisis and Leviathan, know that crises are the best way for government to, to get power to expand their powers. <laughs> Why? Well, it's obvious, because people are scared. And when people are scared, they're going to say, he, do whatever is necessary to make me safe, to keep me safe. All I want to do is just be kept safe. That's, that's all I care about. So do whatever you think is necessary to keep me safe. Because people are scared. You know, their knees are knocking and stuff. And, and so that's the most dangerous time when it comes to liberty. And, and the framers understood this. Our, our ancestors understood this. That's why the, the Constitution had all these guarantees and protections and no exception for crises. You know, that didn't say, hey, no law shall be passed respecting the regulation of speech, oh, except during crises. Because they wanted to make sure that even in crises, especially in crises, the government couldn't run roughshod over the rights and liberties of the people. Do you see American troops, young men and women, arresting uh, other Americans because the president doesn't like what they've said? What would you tell your constituents who admire your love and defense of freedom that they should do if the military comes calling? Well, I don't believe that they should comply with uh, any sort of uh, detention attempts that uh, on the homeland here, taking American citizens from their home, homes are, is outrageous. And so I believe no one should be forced to comply with that. The United States military arresting American citizens and putting them in concentration camps. I wonder how the American people will feel when they see troops in the streets on a regular basis, something no one now living has seen since it ended 
uh, the last time in 1876. What if the liberties enshrined in our Constitution have been transformed into a myth? What if the idea of a Constitution guaranteeing freedom is rich in rhetorical flourish and patriotic fervor, but absent of real meaning? What if the state of freedom in America is actually worse than you think? What if the government had no intention of keeping you safe? but only of using your fears to curb your freedoms? What if the government transitioned effortlessly between rhetoric that referred to foreign enemies and rhetoric that referred to policies at home? What if the government gave itself the power to treat you the same way it treats an enemy on a battlefield? What if your elected representatives actually voted to declare the United States of America a battlefield? What if that included your backyard? What if you woke up one day and soldiers were there because the president sent them? What if they came for you because of your political views? What if the freedom we have was possible in the first place only because we once had a constitution and once had governments that were faithful to it? What if the constitution has just become a piece of paper that the government laughs at? What if the government didn't feel bound by the constitution anymore? What if our rights were conditioned on government approval? What if they were rarely taken away openly and obviously in the day of light, but were chipped away slowly through regulation and fear? What if that's how you were controlled? What if anyone could be detained indefinitely because we're all on a battlefield? What if the government could turn off the media that criticized it? What if one day the government targeted Freedom Watch? What if one night the government targeted you? were the governments to grant and to give away? What if our rights didn't come from God or from our humanity, but from the government? What if the government really thinks we're not unique individuals with immortal souls, but just public property? What if we're only entitled to our natural rights if it pleases the government? What if our rights could be stripped away whenever the government considers us to be its enemy? What if all this could be accomplished with our consent? What if the people's own representatives subverted the Constitution? What if the people were so afraid that they accepted the subversion? What if the government demonizes an external enemy and uses fear of that enemy to suppress our freedoms? What if people are afraid to protest this? What if the government knows this and so chooses enemies that are easily demonized, whether they pose real threats or not? What if threats become imminent dangers precisely because the government allows them to happen? What if government scapegoating an external enemy is as old as the government itself? 
What if the government has used scapegoating again and again to scare people into giving up their freedoms voluntarily? What if the government relied on this to perform the same magical disappearing freedom act time and time again throughout history? What if the government could lock you up and throw you in jail indefinitely? What if that jail was in Cuba? What if the government has written laws to let it detain you forever without letting you see a lawyer or appear before a judge? What if you were just speaking out against the government and it came to silence you? What if the government could declare you its enemy and then kill you? What if your elected representatives did nothing to stop the government from doing this? What if the government claimed that your words made you a warrior, even though there's never been any armed hostilities in your neighborhood, even though you never carried a gun and you never threatened anyone? What if the government could classify the entire country as a battlefield and ultimately a prison? What if the government's goal was to be rid of all those who disagreed with it? What if the real war was a war of misinformation? What if the government constructs its own reality in order to suit its own agenda? What if civil liberties didn't mean anything to the government? What if it just chose to allow us to exercise them because at the moment we don't threaten it? What if the government released a report calling you a domestic terror threat just because you disagreed with the government? What if the government coaxed crazy people into acting like terrorists just to keep you afraid? What if the government persuaded you to believe that the greatest threat to your freedom is an impoverished and uneducated third world population 10,000 miles away? What if the real threat to your freedom is a rich, powerful, and all-seeing government? What if that government thinks it can write any law and regulate any behavior and tax any event no matter what the Constitution says? What if the government is always the greatest threat to freedom because only the government can constitute a monopoly on the use of force? What if, in fact, at its essence, government is simply a monopoly on force? What if, in fact, at its essence, Government is simply the negation of freedom. What if the government monopoly incubated, aided, and abetted the enemies of freedom? What if the government had a multiplier effect on dangers and threats, and even when the government said it was trying to mitigate danger, in fact it was only making it worse? What if when the danger got more threatening, the government told you to sacrifice more of your liberties for safety? What if you fell for that? What if those who traded safety for liberty ended up in government camps? What if the greatest threat to freedom was not any outfit of thugs in some cave in a far-off land, but an organized force here at home? What if that organized force broke its own laws? What if that organized force did the very same things to those it hates and fears that it prosecutes people for doing to it? What if I'm right and the government's wrong? What if it's dangerous to be right when the government is wrong? What if government is essentially always wrong and always dangerous? What if these weren't just hypothetical or rhetorical questions? What if this is actually happening to us? What if the ultimate target in the government's war on terror is all who believe in personal freedom? What if that group includes you? What do we do about it?